I definitely saw how COVID has impacted how we practice. And there was a lot of stress that we identified, not just with patients, but this was also disruptive for our physicians as well. That's Dr. Emmanuel Dizon from the Henry Ford Medical Group. He joins Dr. Dorian Espiritu from the Behavioral Health Services Adult Outpatient Division, along with Dr. Eunice Yu, primary care physician at Henry Ford Medical Group. This episode of Moving Medicine is part of the Behavioral Health Integration Collaborative's Overcoming Obstacles series. We all know about the global mental health access crisis, and our system is not immune to this. So in 2017, we were charged by Dr. William Conway, Bill Conway, who was then our CEO of the Henry Ford Medical Group, with implementing behavioral health integration across our system, which then at that time had 21 clinics and about 210 primary care doctors. Um, and this was fully supported by our leaders in primary care, Dr. Um, Diane George and Paul Zalaji, and um, on the BHS side, Dr. Kathy Frank, who is our chair, and Donna Wellington. We did our due diligence by researching in terms of, you know, what would be the best practices, um, what would be the best uh, behavioral health integration model, and we settled for the collaborative care model at University of Washington Ames Center. We also went on a few trips um, to the Carolinas uh, and Inner Mountain and collaborated with Mayo Clinic, you know, same systems as ours. Our pilot was also supported by a grant from a private foundation, as most pilots are. So I am the psychiatric consultant who works with the whole behavioral health integration team. We had a behavioral health integration psychotherapist and started at your site, um, Dr. Deason and Dr. Yu. Um, so, and before we even go further, um, we just wanted to um, say that we don't have any formal disclosures uh, or potential conflict of interest related to this presentation. So going back to um, you know, the behavioral health integration rollout um, pilot, I would like to ask Dr. Deason in terms of, you know, um, do you wanna share some details um, about our model and why we settled on the particular approach, including why we opted for 100% virtual? Emmanuel? Thank you, Dr. Espiritu. So, you know, in, we were really excited when our leadership wanted to uh, help us to do a behavioral health integration. We had to look at a model that would best fit the needs of our large health system. We actually, we actually have a large geographic footprint and multiple primary care clinics. So we had to look at the different models of collaborative care. And we saw uh, both telemedicine versus having an embedded therapist in our clinic. It was really challenging when we looked at our resources to embed a therapist in individual primary care clinics. And prior to the start of BHI, we actually had some experience with having embedded providers in a few clinics um, as part of some of our other initiatives that we were doing. It, the problem with that is that these schedules for these therapists would frequently fill up and the access challenges that we were trying to address uh, were not really being addressed. And the other challenge was that patients who were in other clinics did not have an embedded therapist that they could go to. So really, we were challenged with how can we provide real-time access to our patients, regardless of whether there was a behavioral health presence or not in our respective sites. Um, when we looked at the research, we saw that telemedicine was just as effective as doing embedded therapy. And because of that, in our experience, as Dr. Spiritu mentioned, we had a chance to visit uh, various areas and various uh, health systems that were doing 100% telemedicine. And we were quite impressed with uh, how telemedicine was able to reach out to patients remotely and, and away from uh, therapists who are not in the office. So we decided to settle on 
100% virtual, kind of a hub and spoke model. So essentially what happened initially is that if a patient presents to my office and I see that the patient has a need and fill some uh, inclusion criteria, I would discuss uh, with them the telemedicine model, which we call VHI. We put in a referral and then the patient would make an appointment to see the therapist. We would let them know from the very start that this was a telemedicine appointment and not a face-to-face. -face. And we also let them know that they would come back to our clinic and do the therapy sessions in a video enabled exam room. So the therapy was actually done by a remote therapist in a central location and the patient would come back to our clinic so that it kind of is a hub and spoke model. So the patients wouldn't be anywhere except in our clinic. They wouldn't have to drive to a separate clinic or a separate facility to get their health care or their mental health needs met. And that's kind of what we uh, settled on and began to develop uh, initially. Uh, I wanted to get uh, Dr. Yu's perspective on this and how that, you know, her experience um, being my fellow primary care champion and being the very first uh, site to do this, to do this uh, program. Thanks, Emmanuel, um, and um, and Dorianne uh, for that great introduction. I I mean, it's been such an incredible experience to work with this team and see um, how the um, spread of this has changed our practice. And it's one of those things where you just can't imagine practicing without it. Um, and um, I'll give an example. So I um, saw um, a 25 year old who. Um, in primary care yesterday, actually, who had um, irritable bowel, um, painful bladder without any urinary findings from urology, um, unaddressed anxiety for many years. She's been scoped. Um, and we were able to, you know, I was, it was pretty clear that she was suffering from a lot of anxiety. And, it, and you know, knowing that I had confidence that I had backup and the support um, from confidence and the support from DHI, knowing that I know that they have their back, that they have my back, um, gives me just this enormous sense of relief that when I broach these conversations, I'm not going to be sending my patient out into the void. So we got into this conversation about her anxiety, and I was able to say to her right there, I have a team of therapists that I work very closely with. I, they can see you quickly, um, usually within two weeks. I have the confidence that I know I can say that. Um, and they're gonna make sure that we work together so that you feel better. And we're not gonna let you go until we see that you get better. Um, and if things aren't going well, they're gonna let me know and we'll come back together to make sure that you get better. And she walked out of there, I mean, just really just having her issues addressed in a way that she had never had it addressed before. And I was able to do that because I knew I had the support from a team that would follow up with her. Um, I started her on Lexapro and um, I knew that, um, you know, my team of therapists would be able to coordinate the care and make sure that she stayed on the medication um, or adjusted the medication if needed, um, helped her address side effects and we would give her the tools that she needed to address some of um, her coping skills. So, you know, that's the kind of sort of where we are now in that it's, I'm not special um, in my group, and I know that um, any one of my colleagues can access this incredible service and have that level of support. Um, really, the confidence in that support and the relief that know, from knowing that my patients are going to get access, they're going to get their issues addressed, and they're not going to let them go until things get better because of their registry model. Um, and knowing that, you know, Dr. Spiritu is going to be there also to provide her expertise if I get stuck is really helpful as well. So, you know, that for me is sort of a, an everyday story um, in terms of. Medicine doesn't stand still. And at the AMA, neither do we. AMA members are physicians like you who are shaping the future of medicine. Become a member today and join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. knowing that I can address these issues um, in a very direct and immediate way. 
Um, so, you know, I think um, I, I'd be curious, you know, Dr. Dizan as the um, physician in charge of our site, how have you seen as we've evolved um, our model from pre-COVID to post-COVID times, um, you know, how has that changed the, um, some of the drivers of burnout that we've seen? I think, thank you, Dr. Yu. I, I, I definitely saw how COVID has impacted how we practice. And there was a lot of stress uh, that we identified, not just with patients. You know, patients have been experiencing a great deal of distress because of this major disruptions in life. But this was also disruptive for our physicians as well. Uh, were a lot of schedule changes, a lot of uh, changes uh, in order to maintain safety protocols. So we actually had to evolve rather quickly in our model. Uh, we, I, we initially started with a hub and spoke model for behavioral health and the therapist would be remote and patients would come into our clinic and go have their therapy sessions in an exam room. With COVID, we were trying to limit the amount of exposure to infection. And we were just toying with the idea of having remote therapy sessions from home or actually away from the clinic. And basically it was beginning to be adopted widely, but COVID basically forced us to go 100% remote. And having that learning, we found it as actually just as effective uh, having patients do their therapy sessions away from the clinic. Initially, there were concerns of, oh, how are we going to address X, Y, and Z? But it turned out that patients were very happy to not come to the clinic to avoid uh, exposure. And providers were very happy to know that they could still refer our patients to BHI and know that they were being taken care of. Uh, our primary care physicians were doing a lot of remote video visits also. So I think that the comfort level with video visits for the primary care, as well as knowing that BHI is 100% virtual, I think that the jump uh, to going remote was actually quite easy and very reassuring, at least in my, my experience and my, the experience of my colleagues who work with me. They were a lot more comfortable making that transition. And they were very grateful for the fact that BHI was still up and running even in the midst of the worst of the pandemic. And I didn't know if Dr. Spiritu had thoughts on how the pandemic has changed, uh, how you guys did it in, in, on the behavioral side and, and, and the benefits of that. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's been written um, that uh, behavioral integration is one of those initiatives that can really address the fourth aim um, which is improving the work life for healthcare professionals. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about pre-pandemic. Um, in BHS, um, it is always difficult to get patients in when we need to see them at the point in their lives when they are in crisis. Um, it is difficult to get patients in when they are ready to come in and see us. Um, we tell them, you know, um, when they call for a panic attack, for example, they. We tell them, oh, unfortunately, we can't see you until you know six to eight weeks from now. And how would you imagine, you know, where the patient would go? Uh, and again, this was all prior to the mental health pandemic that we're experiencing now. Um, our slots are um, always filled, and no matter how many psychiatrists and uh, mental health providers we um, hire, it, it will never be able to address uh, the demand. Um, and primary care physicians were at a loss um, or where to send their patients. Um, if they do refer to behavioral health um, clinic, they really don't know if there is a way, um, if they uh, have a way of um, tracking if their patients were seen, uh, if their patients were being treated or where their patients were. Um, BHI has allowed us to address uh, a lot of this with the use of a registry like Dr. Yu mentioned, and um, working very closely with the primary care team, um, we formed a bond. And so even before the pandemic, it was like a, almost a personal approach when we would send recommendations. We would know when a primary care is close to retiring and we would just like, oh, we're sorry, you're retiring, you know. Um, but then, you know, what was very, um, 
good, at least from our end during the pandemic is, you know, we all, um, it was very evident that each of us needed some encouragement in one way or the other. Um, and because we already had this bond and formed a collaborative community, it was very easy to add on to your recommendations. And by the way, how are you doing? How's your family? Um, please stay safe, have a good weekend, enjoy the weather. Um, and these were things that, you know, primary care doctors appreciated. They would like write a personal note saying, thank you for checking on me. So, you know, it also helped us help each other. Um, not just our patients, but, you know, um, from the wellness point of view of, you know, mental, I mean, behavioral health clinicians and primary care docs. So, um, yeah. Eunice, um, you have something to say? Um, I was just going to say, Dr. I mean, I think that really speaks to the culture that you built as the leader of that, the DHI team, you know, um, that even though you, the whole team was working remotely, essentially from home and doing, um, you know, mobile to mobile um, visits. Um, that you guys still stay connected with each other and you guys supported each other throughout the pandemic. I know you guys did some things um, to help each other out and stay connected, but then also that you were maintaining those relationships with the primary care, um, you know, customers that you were serving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with uh, uh, Dr. Yu and, and, and we really appreciate, you know, the, 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 the personal messages, you know, and knowing that we are, taking care of, of our patients together and we're all in kind of one, we're kind of all united. I think that what helps, but the thing what helps with well, wellness is the fact that we're part of a community and not just kind of separate silos or I am by myself with my practice with my patients, but actually we're a kind of a community where we can all work together and we can all support one another. And I think that that highlighted so much more that was highlighted so much more during the pandemic. Uh, and I really appreciate the ability to kind of collaborate with you guys. Yeah, just that confidence in the support and the relief that <laughs> comes from having that support in a, in a reliable way. And I do want to say like, you know, we're painting this very rosy picture of where we are and mm -hmm. maybe we should talk about some of the challenges that we had along the way, right? So, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, when we first started, um, just bringing in any program, even if it's a program to help and to support is always a lift. It's always a change management process. Um, and we had many PDCA processes and we still do them ongoing to make sure that our processes integrate well from, uh, with primary care. And um, so, you know, I think just from my perspective, um, you know, I, I remember some of the biggest concerns at, when we were first bringing this in um, I mean, the, the biggest pain point from, from my perspective as a primary care doctor pre-CHI was really the access. It was that I would refer someone to behavioral health and then five, six months later, they would come back to the same issue um, and they still would not, you know, like they, and I would say, oh, and by the way, you know, we're addressing your pain, but, you know, we talked about going to see behavioral health, you know, how did that go? And they're like, oh, well, they put me on a list and they said they'd call me and they haven't, you know, so you know, you're kind of like at a loss. You never feel like you have that support that you need from the multi, you know, disciplinary team to manage so many issues in primary care. Um, whereas now I, I feel like, you know, so, so when we were first coming in, you know, really saying our service standard in behavioral health integration is we're going to see your patients in, in two weeks and we're going to reserve same day slots so that if patients are in crisis, they can be seen right away or same day. And we really focused on that in some of our, in our metrics on our dashboard, really making sure that we were maintaining that service standard. And when we see that going down, we know we need to hire more people. <laughs> um, and um, so really, you know, maintaining that as like the big thing, but that's really our big selling point because we do have good DHI, the collaborative care model is based on getting people better and then graduating them into remission and monitoring so that they maintain those open spots. So it's not like tradition, not as bad as traditional um, as, you know, as difficult as in traditional behavioral health where the slots fill up and then you keep seeing the same patients over and over, um, you know, then you immediately fill up that access because you'll never have enough therapists. But we kind of, when people get better, we, they understand and expect that they're going to go into remission and monitoring. We set that up as an expectation from the beginning. Um, so, you know, that, that I think has really helped in that we, we focus on that in access piece 
and that it's going to be high quality access, that we're really focused on outcomes, results, and seeing those scores go down. And if they don't, then we're going to be doing step-up therapy. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. So I think when we were first going to frontline staff who already have too many things to care about, that was really the pain point that we focused on at the beginning. I'm curious if you guys had other things or other things that you felt like we needed to address early on. Well, actually, I agree with Eunice. I think what was really crucial, and, and, and especially with Ford Road, is since this was a new program, we had to really sell it. And I think that having a primary care champion um, that was really convinced and, and, and passionate about it really helped us sell the program because there was, a lot of, there was a lot of skepticism. We were one of the clinics that had an embedded therapist, a provider. And so telling them, okay, we're not going to use this provider. We're going to go virtual. It almost to them seemed like a step back, but then letting them know that we actually can see these patients sooner and that we can get, you know, we can get more real-time therapy, more real-time access. And, you know, it took actually demonstrating it live, having what we call dress rehearsals to show uh, our frontline staff and, and our support staff that this is a model that works and it can be, um, it, it can be effective. But we really had to sell it. And as, as we went in uh, multiple iterations of rollouts, uh, we, we, we started to see the fruit of it because people talk in the, in the organization, they started talking about, oh, there's a program that we're in called BHI. We really like it. And so the engagement actually got bigger as we continued on. But the initial first site you know, it was the, was the, what was we calling the activation energy to get people on board, you know, but um, that was my experience um, trying to get people on board. Yeah, um, you know, all those are, are very, you know, um, difficult challenges in the beginning, um, but I, I know that the secret sauce was having you and, and uh, Dr. Dazen and Dr. Yunus um, as physician champions. What has also um, been a learning experience for me is that we're not only engaging the doctors, it's exponentially engaging everyone in every clinic that we want to. So starting from the customer service representative who are doing the, um, the uh, um, enrollment and you know, um, logging them back in you know, uh, into the clinic, um, the medical assistants, the nurses, group practice directors who are actually our marketing people, <laughs> you know, because they saw how good the program was. And so they were the ones who were actually saying like, when is my clinic going to uh, come in? Mm -hmm. um, and so having a very organized curriculum, um, you know, you know, we had slides, we had, we had to engage every single group instead of just preaching to primary care doctors. Um, so that was one of the you know, things that I thought made it much, much easier to spread because if you think about it, we were very nervous. Once the pandemic hit, we weren't you know, meeting our goal of spreading to the whole system. But yet, even during the pandemic, we were able to um, finish 32 primary care sites. I mean, that is an amazing, you know, um, journey and, and accomplishment, but it's all because of, you know, I, I think it, it's a co collaborative approach and everyone was, you know, into this and, and supported by leadership. So, you know, that was one of my lessons learned. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I think um, exactly like that, ha having those processes um, and protocols so that we could get hit each site and do it in a standardized way um, while allowing that site to kind of tailor a little bit. Um, and that was especially important when we were having, when we were doing um, like hub to spoke, when we were doing site to site, um, you know, care pre-pandemic. Once it became all mobile, then 
um, you know, that rollout became much easier. People just needed to know what the program was, but some of the roles, you know, became much simpler. Like we didn't have to room patients. Um, mm -hmm. We didn't have to, you know, check them in for the special program, things like that. Um, and then I think in addition, just piggybacking on in the 360 engagement, in addition to engaging the primary care teams, but also engaging the patient. And I think part of our list also at the beginning was helping clinicians um, engage patients to do this program, because it's a little different than just being referred to a therapist and going to an office and kind of what people already expect. Um, it's sort of helping clinicians understand what, um, how to engage their patients in this very collaborative process, because the patient's really at the center of the collaboration. Um, so we came up with a mnemonic to um, help ourselves and also our teams remember what is special about the behavioral health integration program or the collaborative care program. We called it the four C's, and one of the C's is actually a Q, but the first, um, the four C's are quick, convenient, collaborative, and coping. Um, and these were these are things that I actually say when I talk to patients about this, and it's what we say when we ask um, clinicians to talk to their patients about it. So kind of hitting those big points in that the that we our service standard is to see within 14 days. It's going to be convenient because we're going to you're going to be able to do it from home when you're on your lunch break in the parking lot. Um, please pull over if you're driving. Um, collaborative uh, in that the PCP remains the doctor and sort of the, the main prescriber, um, that it'll come back to me if things aren't going well or we need to step up therapy, um, that there's a collaboration if the patient has a lot of issues and needs longer term therapy, um, that they can go on to behavioral health and there will be a warm handoff there. Um, so collaborating both PCP and behavioral health and then, um, and that, you know, the big question was really around patient selection in that um, BHI was really a program for mild to moderate presentations um, of mental health. And that really the best way that we thought of, of who would be, who would be able to benefit from BHI were folks who needed help with coping. And that is the, in that, you know, they would do six to eight sessions of brief therapy and coping skills, along with sort of um, a case management approach around medications. Um, and kind of getting folks um, um, better on um, their PHQ-9 and GAT-7 scores. So, you know, we have a lot of other metrics, but I think one other thing that we'd like to share in terms of um, kind of the impact of this program, we did do a case control study um, using uh, the patients who had been referred to BHI compared to similar patients who were not referred to BHI, um, similar in terms of demographics, characteristics, and their initial um, THQ9 and GAD7 scores, and looked at their rate of PCP visits per thousand in a three-month cohort and a 12-month cohort, and we did it over different time periods. And the most robust finding was really that after BHI, people had patients um, who were in BHI had many fewer PCP visits. And this was, you know, replicated in different times and again, um, like with different populations. So this turned out to be a pretty robust finding. And we were really, you know, my, my take on that really is that, um, you know, just like the patient story that I shared earlier, it's that people have these interconnected issues and we really need that multidisciplinary approach to address them well. And if not, they keep coming back to us in, uh, um, in, and we try to address it, but we still, we don't really get to the core of the issue. When we get to the core of the issue, we're able to bring down the number of visits um, to PCP for the same thing over and over. Um, and we're able to address that more effectively. So that was something that we found. Um, and I think also contributes to that feeling of relief, right? Like I don't have the same patient coming over and over that I can't really help because I can't get them access to the services they need. So um, anything, any last words? Dr. Spiritu and Dr. Dizan, I know we're coming up to our time here. Yeah, we're, we're, we so appreciate this ability to be able to share this. But, um, you know, even if we're coming from a big system, you know, uh, fee-for-service point of approach, um, this will also be applicable to, you know, um, smaller clinics, uh, because even if, uh, for as long as you have an organized way of spreading uh, behavioral integration, you will be able to engage one patient at a time, one primary care doctor at a time. So, and, and that's all for, you know, a collaborative community. Um, Emmanuel? Uh, I agree, Dr. Spiritu. I think that this model can, uh, can be brought to scale um, 
so we are a large clinic or a large health system so we there are more moving pieces but even taking a small clinic with a couple of physicians you can easily bring it to scale and um, there are many ways and many iterations of uh, BHI telemedicine I think that that you can do and really it's it's having a primary care champion or somebody who's really invested in, in doing collaborative care. I think that's really the secret is making sure that the person that is going to be involved in the spread is really engaged and really uh, motivated to, uh, to, to overcome the activation energy that's required to get people on board. And that's something that we really learned uh, during uh, our implementation. You just heard from doctors Espiritu, Dizon, and you about beating physician burnout. You can subscribe to Moving Medicine and other great AMA podcasts anywhere you listen to yours or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine.